Okay. Well, I've, I've called this foundations for our faith. I think it is important, I, I guess, as I've been thinking over the last little while about uh, the whole issue of apologetics, I think that there are two uh, primary purposes uh, that, that we as believers might uh, benefit from. Uh, one is, is to, to shore up and strengthen our own faith. Uh, because sometimes we are we are hit by uh, what other people in the world are saying to us, and uh, we know that right from the very beginning that the enemy of our souls uh, has been very good at planting doubts into people's minds, and so uh, I think it's important for us as believers, and particularly sometimes for young believers, uh, just to have our faith strengthened and make sure that we are building our faith upon a strong foundation. But we also know that as we interact uh, with people in the world and seek to uh, to, to share the gospel with them, uh, that very often there are objections uh, that arise and we need to be able to provide answers uh, for them. So let me tell you what I'm hoping to do. Um, and actually, I will be, uh, if, there are, if there are things that you think might be uh, helpful that I've not that I'm not addressing. Uh, feel free to send me a message, and I'll see if I can incorporate it into a later one. But what I'm hoping to do tonight, really, is just to give you an apology for apologetics, and I'll explain that in a minute. Uh, I want to spend the next session with you talking a little bit about world views, uh, because how we view the world, what our philosophy of life is, and everybody in the world has a world view, a philosophy by which they interpret all the information that comes to them. And I think it's really important to get some understanding of that world view. And then we'll talk about the existence of God, the reliability of Scripture, and the resurrection of Christ, uh, probably as three separate sessions. So what I'm looking at is five sessions, but if there are uh, something that you really think will be helpful for me to address, uh, send me a message and I'll see if I can uh, work on something on that as well. Um, <clears throat> but we do know that since the earliest days, the Christian faith has been actively opposed, even during the life of Christ. Uh, on the one hand, we see this great popularity that the Lord Jesus had. As, as crowds, thousands and thousands of people flocked after the Lord Jesus. But then we find that the, the crowd turned very quickly. We find that there were always those who were opposed to the Lord Jesus. And on, on multiple attempts, there were, uh, uh, multiple times there were attempts made on his life to, to, to stone him, to cast him off of a cliff. Uh, but again, he was in control. And so there's this going to be this constant tension that is going on. I was actually uh, reading a book recently on evangelism, a book by Rico Tice called Honest Evangelism. And he calls it Honest Evangelism because uh, he says many books on evangelism uh, don't warn you how difficult it's going to be. And so right up from the beginning of the book, he's saying, yeah, it's going to be it's going to be challenging. He talks about his own experience when as a teenager, he put his trust in Christ and was so excited about his faith and wanting to share it with his, his classmates at school, and he was getting constant abuse because of it. And so he talks about how he was being hit, not physically hit, uh, but these these blows that he kept taking uh, to his 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 uh, mind and to his heart uh, from those who were opposing uh, Christianity. And yet he also speaks about the fact that there are people out there who are hungry, who are hungry for truth, who are hungry for meaning, who are hungry for reality. And he says, unless we are willing to step out in faith and share the gospel with people, uh, we don't know when we talk to somebody whether we're going to get hit or whether we're going to find someone who's hungry. And so again, he's just encouraging us to be sharing our faith, being prepared for that. Uh, and so I think it's an important thing for us to remember. So, as I said, what I want to try and do this evening is just give an apology for apologetics and talk a little bit about the purpose, value, and limitations of apologetics. So turn with me, please, to First Peter chapter 3. And uh, again, this is something I know when I was preaching through First Peter before, uh, I, would have, I would have put a title over the entire book as Godly Living in a Hostile World. Uh, <clears throat> and there is a lot in the book that deals with the question, of suffering, uh, suffering unjustly at times even, suffering for our faith. 
And yet, uh, as when Rico Tice referred to it in the book, it kind of just struck me afresh how significant it is to understand uh, the, the, the question of evangelism and the question of apologetics in the midst of a hostile world. And so in, in 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 13, Peter says, And who is he who will harm you if you become followers of what is good? But even if you should suffer for righteousness' sake, you are blessed. And do not be afraid of their threats, nor be troubled, but sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you, with meekness and fear, having a good conscience, that when they defame you as evildoers, those who revile your good conduct in Christ may be ashamed. For it is better, if it is the will of God, to suffer for doing good than for doing evil. So let me give you a little bit of a definition here of what we mean by apologetics. I know that Andy has already mentioned it there in his prayer, uh, but basically when we talk about apologetics, we mean a defense of the Christian faith. And the Greek word in verse 15 that we just read, where it says, be ready to give a defense, uh, some translations say an answer, uh, but it is the Greek word apologia. Apologia. And so that's where we get this idea of apologetics from. It's the idea of a defense. It's an answer uh, to those who, who oppose us. And uh, Paul would tell us in Philippians chapter 1 and verse 17 that he is appointed for the defense of the gospel, the apologia of the gospel. And so it was something that Paul was actively engaged in. And again, as you, as you go through uh, the, the book of Acts, uh, you see in various different ways, we find that Paul is defending the truth of the gospel that he was preaching. He was proclaiming it, yes, and we need to do that. Uh, but when opposition came against the proclamation of the gospel, then there was a need for him to give a defense of the gospel as well. And so we will see that Paul is reasoning in the synagogues with people from the scriptures. He, again, he's arguing from the scriptures, making a case uh, for the gospel uh, because of his desire for his countrymen and the Jewish people to come to a knowledge of the faith. But we also see that Paul in Acts chapter 17 uh, goes into the uh, Areopagus, Mars Hill, some translations call it, uh, the Areopagus, uh, where these philosophers were gathering, Greek philosophers gathering to discuss something new all the time. And Paul goes in there and again he is proclaiming and defending the gospel in that context as well. So we don't want to get the idea in our mind that when we talk about apologetics that we are apologizing uh, for our faith, but rather following the examples of the apostles, we can argue, we can reason as we seek to defend uh, the faith for the benefit of others. So let me just run you through this little passage that we've read here together just uh, really quite quickly and just talk a little bit about what it is that Paul is talking about here. And I think the first thing that he's telling us is that suffering for, right, for righteousness is not inevitable. I know that there is the truth that the, if we live godly, we are going to suffer persecution. But verse 13 is telling us who will harm you if you become followers of what is good. Uh, the Christian faith is good. Uh, it, it, it makes us better people. And I think that's at sometimes the irony uh, that sometimes even though people are being made better people, sometimes their family and friends aren't happy with the new person that they have become. Uh, they like the old sinful person better. Uh, but I think that there, there should be uh, a goodness about us as Christians, because we are living Christ-like lives. Christ went about doing good. And as believers, we should be going about doing good, being of help uh, to other people as well. And so I think that there is a reality that when we are living godly lives, that sometimes people are going to appreciate uh, the goodness that comes from us, and they will see that we are living good lives. They, they will see our good works and glorify our Father who is in heaven. So our determination must be is that we are to follow what is good. We are to do good to all men, and especially to those who are of the household of God. And so goodness should be a characteristic of our lives as we seek to follow after Christ. But he also tells us that if we suffer... Suffering for righteousness is commendable, in verse 14. 
He says, if you should suffer for righteousness' sake, you are blessed. You're blessed by the Lord. Uh, he speaks well of us. He, he will reward us uh, when we suffer for his sake. Uh, that there is a special blessing and a special reward, uh, even for those who are persecuted to the point of death, a uh, crown of, of righteousness uh, for those who are martyrs. So, that, so there's, it is something that is God will commend us for that. And so we should not be afraid of their threats or be troubled. And again, I think that that is often the challenge. I know it is often the challenge for me. Uh, uh, I have a terrible tendency uh, to judge people by their appearance, uh, by their faces. And I, I vividly remember knocking on a door one time in, in Kilkenny, and uh, when when the door opened, there was this huge man standing behind the door, and I just kind of swallowed and said, okay, I guess i got to share the gospel with whoever opens the door. But he was the most gentle person. But my immediate uh, impression was that this is a guy to be a bit scared of, um, but again, we're being encouraged not to be afraid of their threats or be troubled. And he goes on to explain it a little bit in the next verse. Uh, but he, I think he's telling us in these next few verses that suffering for righteousness provides us with opportunities. And so what he tells us, first of all, is we need to sanctify the Lord God in your hearts or set apart Christ as Lord, other translations say. And so again, if we acknowledge the Lordship of Christ, as the rightful Lord of our life, then it, it makes a difference in how we are going to be able to share the gospel and how we are going to be able to respond to those who oppose us. But what is interesting is that part of what he's quoting there at the end of verse 14 is actually taken from Isaiah chapter 11, say Isaiah chapter 8 and verses 11 to 13. And it says, For the Lord spoke thus to me with his strong hand upon me, and warned me not to walk in the way of this people, saying, Do not call conspiracy all that this people calls conspiracy, and do not fear what they fear, nor be in dread. But the Lord of hosts, him you shall honor as holy. Let him be your fear, and let him be your dread. And the idea is that if we rightly acknowledge Christ, as the Lord of hosts, then we don't need to fear anyone else. Now, again, what Paul, what Peter rather is doing, Peter is quoting from Isaiah chapter 8, a passage that speaks about the Lord of hosts, but he's applying that expression to the Lord Jesus and telling us that the Lord Jesus is the Lord of hosts and we should honor him as holy. We should sanctify him in our hearts. And if he is the one uh, that we fear, if he is the one that we dread, then we don't need to fear anyone else. What can man do to me? If God is for us, who can be against us? And so to know that God is with us should help us and encourage us. Now, I, I, I know uh, the reality is that sometimes when you are out there and when you're talking to people and when they're, if they get aggressive or if they come up with uh, arguments that you haven't thought about before, we can sometimes be intimidated by those things. But again, I think his, his challenge to us, his encouragement to us, is to give Christ the rightful place in our lives, acknowledge him, understand that he is not only Lord in a, in a, in a minor sense. We know that sometimes the word Lord in the, in the New Testament can be translated as Sir. Uh, but, but this, is, is drawing upon this language of the Lord of hosts, the one who is captain of the armies of heaven. He is the one who is there with us. And again, the wonderful reminder uh, that, that uh, those who are with us are more than those who are against us. I, I've heard some fascinating stories uh, about people who believe that in times of great danger and, and difficulty as they've been sharing the gospel, are confident that angels have appeared to them in the midst of their trial and, and protected them. Uh, I was listening to a man a few years ago uh, talking about uh, witnessing in, in uh, Speaker's Corner in London and, and uh, challenging a lot of the, the Muslims who were there. And uh, these guys attacked him and started beating him and kicking him. And he said that there was, 
Out of nowhere, he says, there was this big black man who just jumped on top of him, and he was taking all of the kicks and punches that these people were, were throwing at him. And finally, the crowd left, and he got up, but this black man had disappeared. And he's convinced uh, that this man was an angel, and he said he did see him again another time. Uh, but, but we have the Lord of hosts who is with us. And so, yes, we, we shouldn't be fearful. And yet I know the reality is those times that the, the fear does come in as we are, are facing others and talking about the gospel. But he is also encouraging them to be prepared to give an answer, to give a defense, to give a reason for the hope that is within you. And so I think that there is an element in which we need to do some work. We need to be prepared. And there are times where people are going to raise objections that you don't have an answer for. And that might tell us that we need to go home and do some homework. Uh, we, need to, we need to do some more study. We need to, to pray more. Uh, maybe we're going to find the answers in Scripture. Maybe we will find uh, answers in a book on apologetics or on YouTube of somebody who has answered this question that somebody else is asking. Uh, very often they say people who are uh, involved in full-time apologetic ministry say that usually it's it's the same questions that come again and again, maybe just phrased a little bit differently. Uh, but we we need to be prepared. And so hopefully that's what this uh, session will help us to do, or at least start you getting thinking about it if you haven't already, uh, to, to start researching and say, yes, how can I most effectively respond to these questions that are being given? I don't know if you've heard the story uh, John Lennox talks about uh, when he was a student at Cambridge, and uh, he, he said that he was he was he was ready. Uh, he wanted to be able to to give people uh, a reason for the hope that was within him, and he says nobody was asking him. Uh, so he, he was talking with a friend about it and said, "No one, is, nobody's asking me about uh, the reason for the hope that's within me," and so this friend said to John, he said, "Well." Why don't you ask them about what reason they have for, for their hope? What are they putting their hope in? What are they putting their trust in? And turned it around and gave him an opportunity uh, to find a way to share the gospel with them. So again, we, we need to make sure that we are prepared and doing the best. And again, most of us are never going to be professional apologists. And I'm glad that there are those that we can learn from. But all of us uh, within our circle, um, we need to be ready for that. And again, there, there are uh, people who work in, in the academic realm, uh, those who are involved in university ministries and campus ministries like that, they are probably going to be facing different questions than some of the people that you might speak to, uh, people who, who maybe uh, are long out of school and, and maybe their, their questions might be more religious questions rather than philosophical questions. Um, so again, we need to know to some degree who our audience is, who it is that we're speaking to, and to know how we can give them an answer for the hope that is within us. But he also says to do it with meekness and fear, having a good conscience. And one of the things that I have to constantly remind myself when I get into a, a a debate uh, with someone, that I need to win the person and not just the argument. Uh, sometimes there is, there is a bit of uh, competitiveness that arises within me, uh, that, that I, I, I want to I win the argument, and sometimes you end up crushing the person uh, rather than winning them over. And so we have to guard uh, how we do it and make sure that we are doing it with gentleness, uh, that we really have a concern for their soul and not just for our reputation, not just how we appear uh, before other people. So uh, the this, this suffering that we endure might give us uh, opportunities to be able to share the gospel as well. Now, I just want to let you know that there are different approaches uh, that Christians have taken to apologetics. Um, there is what they call presuppositional apologetics. And there's something that's very appealing to me about this. This is only something I've come across in more recent years, uh, but it really begins with the assumption that God exists and that the scriptures are God's word. And I think that one of the passages uh, that really presses hard on that idea is in Romans chapter 1, where, where Paul... Uh, tells the Romans that 
the things that might be known about God are, are, are known to unbelievers, even people who claim to be atheists. He said they know that there is a God, but they are suppressing the truth in unrighteousness. And so there is a sense where we sometimes feel like, okay, I need to give an argument for the existence of God or an argument for uh, the reliability of Scripture. But there is a work that God has already done in the hearts of every single man, woman, and child. And the reality is, is that as Paul is talking about these idolaters in Romans chapter 1, he says that that idolatry is not showing that they are seeking after God, but rather it is showing that they are seeking to escape from God that their idolatry is an expression of their suppressing the truth in unrighteousness. That because they don't want to deal with a God like that, who is uncontrollable, who is too big and too majestic and too too terrifying uh, when he is seen in his holiness and his glory, they would rather have a God that is controllable, a God that they can put in the closet when they don't want to to have to deal with him. Uh, but But the God that we deal with is a God who is always watching, who is aware of everything that is going on in our lives. And I know in passages like Psalm 139 that talks about the fact that God is everywhere. Uh, when you are when you're in danger, that's a wonderful comfort. When you're misbehaving, that's not such a comfort anymore. And, and yet the reality is true. Uh, that, that God is there. And so people do have that. And so this presuppositional apologetics begins with the idea that, that yes, God exists. People know that God exists. And they know that the, the Bible is God's word, but they're going to try and bring arguments against it. And part of what uh, John Frame is a man that I read on this subject, Apologetics to the Glory of God. And one of the things he talks about in this book is that... Um, <clears throat> He says that, in a sense, people who are suppressing the truth and unrighteousness like that, they're really delusional. Uh, and so we don't accept their delusion in order to speak to them. Uh, if we meet someone who is, is delusional in, in the world, uh, someone who is out of touch with reality, uh, we don't enter into their delusional world to, to interact with them. We keep speaking the truth to them. And he says, so... These people who are suppressing the truth and unrighteousness, we can keep speaking the truth to them. Yes, build a case. Yes, give evidence. Yes, give an argument for it. Yes, show from Scripture all that the Bible teaches us about God and about the Lord Jesus and about judgment to come. We can speak of those things and, and argue with them from Scripture, or present the argument from Scripture. Um, but he says they do know in their hearts that there is a God and they just don't want to accept it. This other idea is what they call classical apologetics. And, and we know that from uh, the very er early centuries, if, if you would read through the, the, the church fathers, as they're called, uh, some of those men in, in the second century and the early third century, they were facing a lot of opposition from, uh, well, even in the first century, opposition from the Jews, opposition from the Greek philosophers. All of these people were opposing Christianity, Roman uh uh, government was was opposing Christianity, and and they were were building arguments. The, these early men were known as apologists, and a lot of it was using logic and reason in arguing first for theism, the fact that there is a God, uh, and then arguing from theism to Christianity in particular. Uh, so again, arguing for the existence of a God, and then showing that the the real God, the true God is the God of the Bible. But a lot of it is on the basis of logic and reason. Now, again, I think that there is real good use of logic. Uh, and I, I wish that I knew more about logic, really, about the formal uh, concepts of logic. But I think that, that I think one of the things that has always been enjoyable to me about Christianity is that it satisfies my head and my heart, that it is, it is rational. It is. It makes sense. Uh, the the Bible is internally coherent and 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 not contradictory, as people would like to tell us. Uh, but also, it makes sense of the world in which we live, and it is the best explanation for all that we see around us. Uh, and so, I think that there is a real use of logic. And uh, we know that it was God himself who says in, in Isaiah chapter six, uh, sorry, Isaiah chapter one, "Come, let us reason together." says the Lord. 
And so there is a use for reason. Now, we don't want to go to the extent that we reject or rather ignore Scripture and just try and use logic and reason. But I think we use Scripture with logic and reason and show that the Bible makes sense and we don't have to commit intellectual suicide in order to be a Christian. And then there is what they call evidential apologetics, which is focusing primarily on historical and scientific facts that lead to a strong probability of the Bible being reliable. Now, again, you can see that's only going so far. And we do know that with anything that we're talking about here in apologetics, we recognize that there are limitations, and we'll talk about that in a few moments. But I think we know from the Bible that without faith, it is impossible to please God. And, and so faith is always going to be rely, going to be necessary. Uh, and so we can we can preach the gospel. We can use logic and reason. We can look at historical and scientific facts that strengthen the case for Christianity. But at the end of the day, there is a heart issue. There is a moral issue. There is an issue of the will that has to be conquered. And there is only so far that we can go in doing all of that. And so we must never think uh, that through our intellect and through our argumentation that we are going to be able to win people for Christ. We have to be in utter dependence upon God. We have to be in prayer as we go out seeking to share the gospel with people. But these are tools that we can use to help us to be more effective in doing that. So let's talk a little bit about some of these limits of apologetics. We need to distinguish between God's work and ours. And so while the Bible clearly speaks of the need for us as believers to be ready to give an answer and of the ministry of defending the gospel that the Apostle Paul was involved in, we also need to recognize that as the Lord Jesus said to Peter, flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And at the end of the day, if somebody gets saved, it's not because of your arguments. It's not because of your cleverness. It's not because of your intellect or mine. It's because God has revealed the truth to them. Again, we were looking this past Sunday in Waterford in Acts chapter 16, where uh, Peter and, and oh, sorry, uh, Paul and Silas and Timothy and Luke uh, come to the riverside there in Philippi. And it says that as they spoke, the Lord opened Lydia's heart. That's a work that you and I can't do. The Lord can do that. And so we need to understand what is his work to do and what is our work to do. And we need to do our work to the best of our ability in dependence upon God and his Holy Spirit um, and recognize that at the end of the day, we can't save anybody. But I, I have actually found through the years that that has been a hugely liberating truth for me. That if I felt that somehow it was up to me, if I was responsible for the salvation of souls, that's a scary thing if we were responsible for it, but we're not. Uh, I actually remember the first time that I did uh, an evangelistic Bible study in Kilkenny. Uh, the first few that I had attended, Mike Atwood had been there and uh, Mike had left uh, to, to go to the States. I was uh, leading the Bible study and... Uh, I remember that Sheila brought a co-worker uh, and he came to one study and said, no, that's not for him. And I remember thinking to myself, if only Mike had been here, Mike would have been able to, to convince them. Mike would have been able to, to get across to them the way that I couldn't. But I had to remind myself that God is sovereign and God didn't have Mike there. He had me there for whatever reason. And again, the problem the reality is probably would have been the same if Mike was there too, because the issue was not the message. It was the person whose heart was not prepared to receive it. So again, we, to me, it's been liberating to say, I, I do my part to the best of my ability. And then we have to trust God by faith to do what only he can do. So while God has committed to us the ministry of reconciliation, we read about that in 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 5, it is God in Christ who is reconciling the world to himself. And as ambassadors, God pleads through us for men and women to be reconciled to him. And so again, we, we see this, this unity, uh, this, this cooperation. There is a work 
uh, that, that God has given us to do. Again, one of the things I've, I've really been enjoying as we've gone through the book of Acts down here is seeing the different ways in which God works in drawing people to himself in the book of Acts. And so on, on one hand, uh, you, you have the, the story of, of uh, the Ethiopian eunuch. And Philip is involved in an in a effective evangelistic ministry in Samaria. And God says, go out into the wilderness, go into the desert. Uh, and so he goes. And when he gets out into the desert, uh, he, he's told to draw near to the, to the chariot. When he draws near to the chariot, he hears the man, the, the, the eunuch in the chariot, reading from the Isaiah. He asks the man, do you understand the things that you're reading? And he says, no. How can I understand it unless someone explains it to me and invites him to come up into the chariot to explain it to him? But God just didn't directly intervene in the life of the Ethiopian and send an angel or even his Holy Spirit to speak directly to the Ethiopian eunuch. He called Philip and sent him to a particular place and put him there so that he could bring the gospel message to him. The same thing happens with uh, with Cornelius in chapter 10. And Cornelius is, is this man who is praying and passionate and desiring to know God. And God says that his prayers have come up before him and his good works have come up before him. But chapter 11 will tell us that uh, he needed to hear words by which he must be saved. So even though he was so religious, even though he seemed to be searching after God, he needed to hear the message. And so he's told via a vision to send for for Peter, who is is uh, down in another town. Go, you'll find him. He's praying. He's on the rooftop. And then God has to prepare uh, Peter because this is outside of Peter's comfort zone to go into the house of a Gentile and to, to, to have table fellowship with him and to preach the gospel to him. But again, even though you have this divine intervention, both in the life of Cornelius and in the life of Peter, it's Peter who has to bring the words by which he must be saved. And so that work, that work of reconciliation, that ministry of reconciliation has been committed to you and I. We are God's ambassadors and God is pleading through us for men and women to be reconciled to him. So I think it's important to understand that while apologetics, I think, are valuable and helpful, there are limits to what apologetics is able to do. So as we share the gospel, we rejoice in knowing that the gospel is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes, Romans 1.16. We know that it is a stumbling block to the Jews. We know that it's foolishness to the Greeks. We know that as we go out and speak to people in the world who are being educated and indoctrinated in the things of this world, and it's foolishness to them, yet God is saving Jews and Greeks and Americans and Irish people and Asians and Africans. He is saving people today. He continues to add to the church daily those who are being saved. And so we need to seek and study and be prepared to give an answer for the hope that is within us. But our faith is not in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. And so I think that's really just the, the message that I want to get to. Uh, I know Seamus told me I could go a little longer tonight, but that's all I really want to do. Uh, the next section will be a, another major uh, thing to look at. Uh, so we need to go forward in confidence. We need to believe that the gospel is powerful, uh, but we also have a responsibility uh, to do our part and to be able to, uh, to study, to learn, and to find ways to be as effective as we can in sharing the gospel with others. Let's pray. Father, we are so thankful for the Lord Jesus. Father, we are thankful that there is so much evidence that we can find uh, in history uh, that, that encourages us to believe in the Lord Jesus. And yet, Father, we, we also know that the, the scriptures themselves have a power that as we, as we heard it preached, as we read it, uh, we recognize that it's a living word, uh, that is able to bring people to salvation. But Father, we, we do want to be, we do want to be ready. Uh, we do want to think through, uh, some of the objections that people in the world today are raising and to think how we can effectively as we can answer uh, some of those questions. 
Uh, Father, again, we, we recognize, we want to recognize the limitations of what apologetics can do. But Father, we know that as, as someone has said, apologetics is brush clearing, getting the objections out of the way so that people can hear the gospel and that they can be, they can be sure that this is something that is, that is true and that is trustworthy and that is reliable and that will provide them a foundation for their faith. And Father, we pray that we as believers uh, will be shored up and confident uh, in, in the message that we are preaching as well, in the reliability of Scripture. And Father, we just pray that you will continue to lead us and guide us as we seek to share the gospel with others. In Jesus' name, amen.